this episode of LMS Builds, we're gonna show you how to do a pro quality engine build cheap, but good, but, but cheap, right? Cheap, but, but still good. All right, let's get to it. What's the first step? Clean up your junk. Everything around here, you need to clean up. Professional engine shops use what's called an engine clean room. Yes. You've spent many an hour in one. What's it like? It's so spotless that they have to spray me with cleaner the second I walk in because I'm so dirty all the time. They don't like me coming in there. So we're not gonna achieve that, but we're gonna get close. And we're gonna show you how. Yep. All right, let's get to it. All right, what's step two? Step two is get the tools you need to do a proper engine build. Um, there's a couple tools here that you're gonna wanna spend good money on because they're really critical. And there's a couple tools that you can, you know, go a little on the cheaper end, not necessarily bargain basement, um, but you don't need, you know, Snap-on or Matco or uh, Mitutoyo for everything. So first thing, torque wrench. This is absolutely critical. You have to have a torque wrench. Um, you don't need to buy the most expensive torque wrench. This is actually a really cheap old Craftsman one. Um, and we're gonna use this for the build. What we did is we had a Matco guy, when the Matco truck, you know, tool truck comes around to you know, various automotive shops, you can have them certified. So this one's actually been certified, uh, calibrated, and then you know your torque values are correct. So that's my quick tip, buy a cheap torque wrench, but have it professionally calibrated. Um, the micrometer. So this micrometer set is from, where is it from? From like 1944 or 1945. Um, this is an old used micrometer set. The micrometer needs to be relatively accurate, but it doesn't need to be your best tool. And I'll show you why. Um, what you're gonna be doing with this is you're gonna be using this to compare the size of, you know, the outside of journals, like on crank journals to the dial bore size that we're gonna use the nice stuff for. So this just needs to be able to hold a value. The absolute value doesn't matter that much. Um, the, the dial bore gauge does matter though. So we spent the money, we got a Mitsutoyo dial bore gauge. I've actually got two different sizes of the measuring head on here. That's because we're doing some weird stuff with this engine and we actually went under two inch for the rod journal, so that requires a smaller head. If you've got a normal engine, most engines, it's two inch and above, so you're only gonna need the one set. Now, I found this on sale for about 400 bucks. Um, that sounds like a lot of money to a lot of people for a tool, but this is absolutely critical. Um, it's not something you skip on, and the pros are using even more expensive ones. Um, so I would recommend spend your money on this, skip the Starbucks for a year or something. <laughs> Um, just, just get this and do this right. So those are the key tools. Obviously you're gonna need your ratchets and your standard you know, hammers, things like that. Um, but these are the really critical tools to ensuring that your engine does not blow up the first time you run. <laughs> we don't want that. Okay, so what does shifting above 7,000 RPM do? So um, I have to admit, I took my Mustang, you might've seen the Mustang in an earlier uh, dyno episode, um, took it autocrossing. We drove down to Peru, Indiana for the cam challenge and I had the car off the trailer for what, Travis? 15 minutes, something like that. Um, went out and literally did one autocross pass. We were rushing, did one pass and I hit the rev limiter and kablooey, um, dropped a valve. So. You can see on the cylinder head, I ruined, this was a, a expensive ported set of cylinder heads and just annihilated it. Um, you can see the seat got blown out here, the valve seat, and um, you can see part of the valve is actually in the piston, blew through here. Now amazingly, we didn't hurt any other part of it. 
Um, I, I can't believe that the parts didn't make it into, you know, ruin the crank or, or the block or something. So I was a little lucky there, but uh, lesson learned. I bought these heads used. I didn't know um, exactly what machining and what work was done on them. Um, so that's kind of a mistake. I did it on the cheap. I mean, to be fair, they did last, what, four years? I think I had the car together four years. And um, so I guess you get you get what you give. You, you uh, reap what you sow there um, with cheap machine work. So that brings us to the replacement. Now, we got these cores. It's kind of hard to find cores for these engines now. So we got these cores out of the junkyard off of a cabillion mile F-150. Um, so, Maybe Travis will edit in a clip of that. It's pretty funny. Um, I'm like sitting on top of the engine. Hey, Dwayne, what you doing? All loads of fun sitting on top of this monstrosity trying to make a race car out of junk. So if you want to save money, this is what you got to do. Take some elbow grease, right? I mean, I guess this is kind of our MO, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hiding on this uh, junk F-150 set of race cylinder heads. Little, little did they know. <laughs> so that's step three. Step three is to find a good machinist. This is really, really important um, for everyone watching. The machinist is gonna save you money. Spend the money on good machine work. You know, we were talking about tools earlier. A good machinist is worth more than good, good measuring tools. So. They will measure this stuff for you if you're willing to pay for it. They'll check all the tolerances. They'll even assemble the engine if you're willing to pay for it. But find a good machinist. They'll recommend things. They'll know what tolerances to put in the engine. I can't stress enough how important it is to do your research on what shop to take your stuff to. Do not shop by price. Spend a little bit more money. It's going to save you money and time in the long run. I chose Livernoy Motorsports, which is in Dearborn, Michigan, partly because I've been working with them for over a decade. Um, they've never done me wrong. They're not the cheapest shop in town. I will admit that, but I have only good things to say about their work. Um, so that's where I took my block and heads to. They're local to me, which is an advantage. I understand shipping stuff can be expensive. So do your research, find a shop near you. Um, and again, just don't shop by price. Don't shop by some big advertised number on their personal race car. They're obviously going to do more you know, more work on their own personal stuff than they are in some customer job they're putting through the door. I would actually say, find the shop near you that is, has been in business the longest. That's probably a good indication. If they've lasted 20, 25 years like Livernoy has, they must be doing something right. Cute little motor you got here. It is small, I have to admit. <laughs> it looks pretty small sitting here on the stand. The, the bores are small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's not my typical push rod, big bore, uh, you know, torque monster, but these things are actually pretty potent on a, you know, per cubic inch uh, basis. So. Yeah, I mean, we saw before it made pretty good power mm -hmm. and that was with essentially a junkyard short block. So I think we can do a little bit better this time. Maybe a hundred, I don't want to say all that, maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred horsepower per liter, but I'm not going to put that in the world. <laughs> maybe, maybe. maybe. Um, so yeah, what do we have done? We had the the engine bored over to fit our new pi pistons. So they're 20 over uh, pistons. And we also had the decks cleaned up to make sure our ceiling surface is really good. Now, there's a difference between low quality work and high quality work. When we had the, the uh, piston let go, or the valve let go, I'm sorry, and hit the piston, we had some scores in, in the cylinder. Um, and I was not sure that this, this block would be able to be saved. So I took it to Livernoy, obviously, a good machinist. And then what they did is they honed that, that broken cylinder essentially to size for the piston to check if it would be okay. Um, they worked with us a little bit on that and it was okay. So they honed them all and they did the rest of the machine work and it came out absolutely perfect. Um, you know, they, they went as far as to, you know, pair every piston, each piston is numbered to each hole that it's gonna fit into. Um, you know, if you, if you don't get something like this from your machine shop, if they don't ask for those pistons, yeah. whenever you go to get them, uh, you know, your, uh, your block bored and honed, run. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do business with them um, because it's, the, the piston to bore clearance is very important. And Super it's, important. And, and it's important that it's consistent, and, yeah. you know, these are the things that you're gonna do that you're gonna spend a little bit more time, a little bit more money, but this is a motor that's gonna run for a lot longer than something that 
you piecemeal put together, slap it together, and you know, send it. But it's not that much more time consuming. No, it's, it's one of those things where, you know how you go online and you look at those, you know, rear Morrison engines and you look at those, um, you know, Sean Highland engines, these expensive, Ilmore, you yes, know. any of these expensive, expensive engine builders, um, they're measuring everything and they're taking their time. You know, like I said, like Travis said, I'm sorry. Um, if you're taking your engine to have it bored and they do not ask for the pistons, they're crap. That, that should be a good test to determine yeah. if your, if your machinist is any good. Um, like you said, each one of those pistons now has a specific home in the block. That's how it should be done. Um, they ask what kind of alloy it is because if it's 26, 26, one eight two six one eight is that right twenty six eighteen twenty yeah twenty six eighteen aluminum or um, four zero three two they expand differently there's all kinds or of things. eutectic pistons don't expand as much if you're you know it's a basic you know uh, stock rebuild cast pistons still do it yeah you if you're gonna spend the money to do it do it right it's not like you're grabbing a junk care short block shoving twenty pounds of boost down it and seeing what happens you're just putting the money in it to build a motor that's gonna last yep yeah so and we that, got. Okay. I mean, really what that does is that brings us to step four, which is measure, trust, but verify. Um, we're to the measurement step now. So we have some of the numbers that uh, Livermore put together for us. We're going to actually take our own independent measurements. Um, but there's a couple more things that we're waiting on from the machine shop. Um, the crank. Yep. Um, we had to send a rod and piston, ring pack, all that stuff so it can be balanced. Um, but once that's back, we'll actually get to the measure portion of uh, what we're doing here. Yeah, so the crank is actually pretty cool. We did something a little unique. Um, we use a, a couple of tips and tricks from the circle track world. Um, that's why I actually had to buy that other, uh, the Mitutoyo head for the dial bore gauge because of this. Are you gonna let me do it? I'll let you do it. You let me do it. Look at the speed hole. Speed hole in the rod. Look at that. Look at that. What is that? It looks like a manufacturing defect, doesn't it, to a lot of people out there? Yeah. Why would you put a hole in something that needs to spin, you know, 7,000 RPM? And the reason is, is computers, science, stress analysis. Yeah. That area of the, the rod really doesn't see much stress. Now, much stress, that, that's not a term you can say in a, in a vacuum because we decided this is only going to be an NA motor. Yes. So we're not going to be putting boost down it. You might want something that's a little bit stronger for that application, but a little tickle nitrous or NA, it'll be just fine. Yeah, so what Travis is saying and, and what a lot of people don't realize is when you buy most aftermarket rods, and this is particularly true with like if you buy a rotating assembly, like a stroker kit, um, they're building it for the sort of person who is basically a moron. Um, they're building it for the person who is going to stuff all the boost in it, run, you know, run boost and nitrous. So they tend to overbuild things in the aftermarket. Um, this is a rod for a small block Chevy for a circle track motor. It's, it's kind of special. It has the small block Chevy um, rod pin, 0.927, but this has a Honda rod journal size. So in the circle track world, they do that because it reduces the weight of the crankshaft because your throw is smaller and it reduces the size of the rod. So the rod ends up smaller. You also get less friction because you have less surface area in the journal. Now you would not want to make a thousand horsepower on this this rod and bearing. Um, some of the Honda guys do do it, but, but they uh, do it because of RPM. They're much higher, and it's it's the cylinder pressures aren't as high. They also um, tend to use bearings that cost a billion dollars, yeah. and you can't get <laughs> and kill the environment. But um, so this is a cheap trick. These rods are actually inexpensive, because, very affordable because um, you know Circle Track they call them claimer classes. They have to um, keep the cost really low for this stuff. So this is a cool trick. I'll show you how it works. We'll explain when we get the crank pack back what happened. We did this to the uh, stock crankshaft, so you can get it machined for this. Um, it's a much cheaper way to, to change your stroke and change the weight of the crankshaft. So instead of increasing the weight of the rotating assembly, we're gonna reduce it so this engine will be really And we're gonna to turn a 4.6 into a 4.8. So yeah. it's essentially free cubic inches. Yeah, and I think it's what 14 more cubic inches, something yeah, like and that. Who doesn't want a bigger motor? It'll be cool. We'll explain it all. Um, but again, this comes back to find a good machinist because you wouldn't be able to figure out all the tolerances to make your deck height work and all that without you know someone who knows what they're doing. And no matter how good they are, verify their dimensions. Yes, yeah, verify it. People Always. make mistakes. Yeah. And, and a good machinist will, will own up to it and they'll fix it, yep. they will. So 
that's where we're at. That's what's that's what's happening, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. We'll Crank see. should be back yeah. two three days. We'll see you soon. I need it. <laughs> <laughs>